Name another podcast like this. Who gonna bring it to the table? Boss talk. Who your girlfriend favorite? Boss check it, check it, check it. This is Unique Hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? No, no, Madea, walk on. Man. But y'all don't forget, y'all need to like, subscribe, share all our content. We're on all social media platforms. We're on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, we're on it. But make sure that you. Go ahead and um, follow our Patreon page because that's the only place that we're going to be able to find. You're going to be able to find our full length videos. So don't forget to tap into Patreon. Man, you know, this guy we got on here today, y'all, he don't need no introduction. The culture sees him coming. I've seen this guy with all type of people. I, I, I know already that everybody is looking at what he's done, you know, uh, when it comes to reform, it ain't nobody that's on this guy's level. You know, um, I've been, you know, I, I see him and, and I'm trying to understand what, you know, everything that, that he embraces, you know. And we talked a little bit the other night, but let's, let's go and get it going, man. Bruce is in here, man. Say, man, look, man, you one of them guys, man. The big reform movement the is on The big that. reform <laughs> movement, bro. That's what we doing. Man, like, did you ever see it coming, though? Like, like did you know this is what, like... And we're going to get into everything because she's going to get into everything. She goes back. But did you ever see the movement coming like it's coming right now? And I actually had to start out. Um, no, nah, I actually didn't know that things was going to turn out the way that it is now. But that just go to show you the testament of God. Man, that's hard. That's hard. Okay. So um, I like to go back into the, your history because... People want to know, and I know you you've said it before, but we going I'm gonna do it a little bit different. I got you. So we like to know where you you're Dallas native, of course. Oh, Cliff, America, to be exact. Okay, and you know what? Some people were surprised about that. They thought you were probably from Houston or somewhere else, but we yeah. happen to know that you Dallas. Um, <laughs> raised with your grandma. I was raised by my grandparents, but my mother was a part of my life as well. Where was your dad? We don't even know him. Cause I noticed that I never heard you really talk about. It. You never knew him. Do you know who he, he who he is? I couldn't tell you who he is if he was to walk through the door right now. Really, not even a name. I want to say I know his name, but I can't remember it. So your name. mom never told you his name, no. or your grandma. I mean, you know, when you uh, when you a deadbeat, they don't really bring you up. I know, but even if you're a deadbeat, I'm sure that the whole family a deadbeat. I think the whole family's a deadbeat. Really? Yeah. One thing I always tell people, and this is my point of view, I always tell people it's always good to know, even if you don't deal with them, you always want to know your family but for, for the main reason of medical issues. What's your medical, medical stuff. Issues? Because I know a lot of people who've been through certain things where they maybe... It could have got fixed had they known the family. Right. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know... This side, you know, when you go get your checkup, they always say, does this run in your family? Does that run in your family? If you only know right. one side of your family, you can't really answer accurately, well, this runs in my family or not. You don't know. You understand what I mean? I got Even you. if you just get certain information. then. But then at the same time, so, okay. So only your mom. You don't know nothing about your dad. Uh-uh. Okay. But I know everything about Vicky Michelle. <laughs> so, y'all were, so you were born in Dallas. How Oak long Cliff were you? America. Okay. Oak Cliff is part of Dallas, isn't it? Uh, it depends on who you're talking to. Okay, so tell me the difference. I'm not from here, so I'm trying to get an education about it. Um, Oak Cliff, America, we kind of got our own little thing going on. We we are a part of Dallas. If you ask people, you know, I'd say I represent the city, but I'm from Oak Cliff. And you said Oak Cliff, America. Why you put America at the end of Oak Cliff? Uh, just to, you know, spread the awareness. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just checking because that's the first time I ever heard it. I got Never you. heard anybody else say Oak Cliff America. Oak it's Cliff always America. Oak Cliff. No, Oak Cliff America. Okay, so how old were you when you moved out of Oak Cliff? Um, I was 17. I moved out of Oak Cliff to go to the penitentiary. Right. So that, was that the first time you went to the penitentiary at 17? That was the first time I had ever been uh, sent, to sent to prison. I had been in and out of juvenile. juvenile. But okay. that was the first time I had actually left home. Mm. So, okay. I know a lot of our fans might not know because I looked you up. So I know a lot of little things about you. Okay. So go ahead and let them know about, okay, growing up with your mom. Uh -huh. What was it like? Vicky crazy. <laughs> um, I came from a, 
I will. I want. It, I like to say that it's not a dysfunctional household, but in the modern world, they'll call it a dysfunctional household. My mother, she a product of the streets. So, um, at, you know, 11, 12 years old, I was already knee deep in the streets running behind my mama. But you were raised in the house with your grandma. So was your grandma the same way? No, nah, you know, they old school. You got to go to church on Sundays, right. Monday through Friday. You need to be in this house at a certain time. And if you if you ain't here by the time the door get locked, don't even come here. So if your grandma was like that, how did your mom end up being so different? That's a good question. You'd have to ask Vicky that, but... Vicky most definitely was something way different than my grandmother. See, that's the thing I always would, I've learned this as I got older. When you see dysfunction in a person, first thing you want to do is like, let me see your mom, let me see your dad, let me see your environment, because you know it had to come from somewhere. Right. So let me say this as well. Um, I like to tell people, I knew two different Vickys. So I knew the Vicky that, um, that raised me, that went to church every Sunday, that was a good woman and cooked. And then I knew the Vicky that was strung out and turned out on drugs. So at the age of 11, that was the Vicky that I was dealing with. She mm. was no longer the Clark Huxtable type of mother. Mm. Do wow. you know what happened that turned her onto drugs? Uh, you know, trying to chase behind a man, trying to please a man, doing what she can, doing what she got to do to provide for her kids and you know, you young, you wild. That's like in today's time, everybody is strung out on um, K2 or mm-hmm. meds or fentanyl. fentanyl, pills. That was the drug at that time. That was the drug of choice, and mm-hmm. she got strung out on it. And that was, that was the beginning of the downfall or the spiral. Did you ever, I know you were a kid, but as a kid, you had to grow up real quick. Correct. So did you ever turn to her and be like, you need to get off of this stuff? Yeah, Vicky going to slap the cowboy shit out of <laughs> You better not be questioning her and asking her, you know. Um, nah, I ain't never said nothing like that to Vicky. Oh, okay. Yeah, nah. nah, she don't play that. Nah, I get it, man. Like, to me, the stories are not, you know, far-fetched because I'm a dude that come from understanding and maneuvering in the streets. You know what I'm saying? So to sell drugs to whoever... It, it it wasn't far fetched, or to or to cook drugs, or to take drugs, or whoever. It didn't matter. A right. village, as they always like to say in the positive way, it take a village. I could destroy a village with the stuff that we was doing back when we were in the early nineties. Mm-hmm. This is what we done. Right. You know what I'm saying? If you wasn't selling it, then you was doing it. And if you wasn't doing it, and you wasn't selling, and you was a kid, then you was somewhere struggling, trying to understand how to make it. Because at the end of the day, we gonna find a way to make a way out of no way. You know, so the 11 year old, if he ain't, if he ain't, he, his mama doing it, he gotta be selling it himself or trying to find out how to hustle mm-hmm. or asking somebody for mo- money, a beggar. You had kids that beg. The, you, you got, I, I remember when I was a kid in Vegas, I'd go beg. So that ain't nothing, you found a way. Well, I found the way from being around my mama. There you uh, go. One of the blessings of my mother is that uh, she exposed me to the game at a young age, so I understood Income tax coming. I'm finna let him carry you on your income tax, and you gonna get two, three thousand dollars, and this, that. You know, those are the little hustles that That's I learned along the way. Were you on the child? 50. No, I have two younger brothers. One dead, and um, the other one is. Um, I don't even know what to say about the other one. Wow, <laughs> wow. So they had to go through the same things that you went through as a kid growing up, right? Well, I, I like to say my baby brother, he had a. Uh, I ain't gonna say he had a choice. He went through the same things, but you would think seeing, you know, your mother, your oldest brother, then your next oldest brother, that would kind of transform you. But it didn't. He followed the same path, and um, unfortunately, he's still dealing with that. Mm. Wow, it's hard, man. When you when you see, you know, and you think because they see you doing better, they'll right. try to do better. Right. But it do don't better. work like that. Uh-uh. I'm a living witness. Yeah, it don't. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, nah, it don't work yeah. like that. It don't work like that at all. So let me go back just a little bit into when you bump your head and you end up having to go to TDC. What was the reason why you had to go to TDC? Um, I got four aggravated robbers with deadly weapons and four aggravated assaults with deadly weapons. Wow. And TDC, that wasn't prison. That's no, that's, four, that's, that's, that's prison. Your, okay. Texas you, Department Texas of Criminal, Criminal Justice. Justice. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. so, so, you went to juvie how many times before that? Oh, I had been in and out of juvenile since I was 11. Since 11. So you always got caught then? Yeah. So from the age of 11. <laughs> See, hell, man. So <laughs> from the age of 11 to uh, what? 31, 32, I had been in and out of the judicial system. This is the longest I've been free since I was a child. Wow. Mm. Wow. So 
when you get ready to go to TDC, uh, you got these. Did you stay in the county long? You know, you had to fight your case. Did you get a court appointed? Yeah, I got a court appointed lawyer. Yeah, I was there probably about six months. See, that's how I be you. Were you in the government center? I was in the government yeah. center on the 12th floor, to be exact. Yeah, and, and you were down there in that white. You were down there chilling. Chilling. And, and, and basically, uh, how was it preparing yourself to go to Prince? See, I go all the way in. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So, <laughs> you know, they had New Highland Jail when I was down there. You know what I'm talking about? The, the jungle, nigga. The, oh, no, you know no, 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 no. That's how it's still going on. So when I was getting ready to go to jail, you know, I'm on the uh, aggravated tank, 12th floor. So I'm in there with everybody. But the most unique thing about me preparing, my mother is the one who prepared me to go to prison. Wow. Really? Yeah. She told you exactly what to expect, what to do, and all of that. And told me that if you don't come back home, a man don't even come back here. Wow. Really? Yeah. Vicky wow. different. Wow. So when you got on there, she, she gave you prep talk. Oh, yeah. So, you know, in the county, before you catch the chain bus, you get to make that one last yeah. phone call. So, you know, I call her, tell her, hey, man, they, they here to get me. They say I'm on the chain bus. You know, I'm finna go to prison. Like, damn, this is serious. Like, it's finna really happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it kicked in. Oh, yeah, they downstairs. They said, Bruce, to pack it up. You know what I'm saying? So as a child, you know, you sitting there kind of waiting to hear you. Your mama say, I love you. It's going to be okay. She ain't said nothing like that. This woman on the phone, she, um, okay, so check this out. Um, you know, we don't have the kind of family that's going to be coming to see you, that's going to be sending you money. <laughs> Reality. We, yeah, no, nah, she's serious. We, yeah. we don't have that kind of family. So what we finna do is we got like three, four hundred dollars. We finna send that to you. That money is not for you to go to commissary. You need to go get your appliances, your clothes, everything you gonna need. At least need. you got some. Yeah, she was like, "Nah, you gonna you need to get the stuff you gonna need because we don't have a family that's gonna be sending you money, mm -hmm. and you need to find you a hustle once you get in there." Has she ever been to prison before? Oh yeah, Vicky done been down about two, three times. Okay, that's why she know exactly what to say and all of that. Yeah. Oh man, my mama had a whole rundown of what to do, how to do it. Mm -hmm. She told me when you get in there, make sure they know you from Oak Cliff. You know how you was representing the hood out here? Make sure you repping in there. Go go get to the business. Wow, that's crazy. But then woman prison, I always would ask, is woman prison any different from the male prisons? I don't know. I heard it is, but when I used to go visit my mama, they used to be screaming and rowdy. So <laughs> I didn't see a difference. They be making all kind of noise. So how old were you when you had to go visit her all the time? I was like, what, seven, eight, Jeez. nine, going to go visit my mom. Do you remember what you were thinking at that time? Um, yeah, I was thinking that I need to be at the house playing, but my grandma making me get up to go visit her. <laughs> you didn't even want to go. I didn't even want to go, but my grandmother, she was one of those women that uh, you going to go see your mama. That's good. So, you know, wow. the weekends, we got to go see her. Mm -hmm. So That's when good. you hit the unit, did you hit what? Did you, you hit a transfer? I Let's went to Middleton unit. You was at Middleton? Off the what, was you at B? What, 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 what dorm? I was down on... on 50 man tank, 48 man tank. It was a 48 man tank. We in yeah. the dorm. Let's ride. So I was going yeah. through. <laughs> Let's ride, nigga. I was going through transit. Okay. So uh, I think I was there for like six, probably about six months. Probably wasn't even there. I give it about four or five months because we got into a ride and they shipped me right yeah. off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So so your first time, you pairing it up, you down here, they, they, y'all they make sure you shaved, all, all this. That. You, 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 you trying to get out of them. Yeah. Get out! Of, get, get up out of get here! Out of All here. this, you know, what I'm you dealing with this for the first time, though. right? But probably people done told you a little bit about it, but ain't nothing like dealing with it firsthand. I'm just talking about when you first get there. It's like, wow, damn, they really doing this down it. here. Mm -hmm. I was sitting. So once you get there, you know, you go through the intake process and all that. When I finally made it to my dorm, to my bunk, and I was sitting on the bunk, I was sitting there like, man, I'm in the penitentiary. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I'm looking around and I'm just like, damn, bro. I couldn't believe that I was really sitting in prison. It took me a while to even just like process. It. Yeah, I'm like, damn. I'm asking them, man, what time breakfast? Oh, they call breakfast at about two in the morning. <laughs> two in the morning? Mm, that early? What? I say, bro, at two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, that's the that's when it started. So I'm like, okay, well, when lunch? Lunch start at nine. I'm like, damn, that I'm ain't just no lunch. Up. That's breakfast. That's breakfast. <laughs> I'm like, damn. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, this is so a whole. So what time you go to bed? Wait a minute. Did what you, time you, you go wait, to bed? Let me get in there. Did you have to go to one AP? Did you get to take one AP, please? What's that? The one. The, no, you had to go hit on it. 
Oh, so this is the game. My mama, she my mama put had, on it. Oh, she had already gave me the game. Make sure you tell them you got asthma when you get there. That's going to get you out the whole squad. So, you know, when I get her, I'm running everything down. But they, you still got to have a job. Yeah, yeah. Luckily, I was the SSI. Okay, yeah. What's that? Uh, like the janitor that Janitor? they get to clean up. Okay. So, I'm cool. I get to move around a little bit. But, uh, man, the reality of the fact that I was sitting in the penitentiary, I was just kind of like, this shit real. Yeah. This is not TV. Did you feel like I got to get out of here? Nah. Nah, nah you don't. That was like the fuck. I was sitting in there like, man, it's over, man. I don't even know if I'm going to make it back home. How many years is this that you're going to have to sit out for during this time? So I had I started with a 10-year sentence and ended up doing 13 and a half. How do you uh, How but, does it go up? Yeah, it's something he done done so. Yeah, I caught a case while I was yeah, down there. Yeah. Oh, okay. So when you when when you there, you you own this transit, you you this transfer unit, but you in your mind saying I got to get to a convict unit. I got to get somewhere where I can No, nah, that You you like the transfer So in center? my mind, I'm thinking, man, I'm going to get in school. I'm finna do right. I'm finna try to hit her up and make parole and, and, and get out of here. Man, as soon as I walked the bowling out of two, three of my home, what, look at how K whoop the whoop, whoop the whoop. It was going down. That's exactly two, right. Two or three of my homeboys from the world seeing me. They like, oh yeah, that's K right there. Yeah. Whoop the whoop. I was like, oh man. <laughs> What's up, homeboy? What's up? What, what you where you at? Man, we gonna come get you. It's whoop a party. Whoop. And it go to going down yeah. from right there. <laughs> from right there. I was good until my partner saw me. As soon as they saw me, it was a wrap. Mm. That's crazy because that's the way it be going down. Yeah, now nah, I tell people, man, as soon as they saw me, hey, that's K from Oak Cliff. He this, woo, he woo, good. Woo, woo. Yeah, oh, no, nah, let's go. Hey, look, I'm, you got to do some checking over here, man. You know, they check, they hard checking over here. Yeah. So um, when they call Last Rick, man, go, on, go out there and get that out the way. Yeah. I'm sitting there like, yeah, what he talking about is if somebody coming in, you and saying he did so that you got to you finna have to stand yeah, you on that. Check it, yeah. Oh yeah, you finna have to stand on it. And everybody got to go through it. Oh yeah, ain't no special, <laughs> ain't no special treatment. <laughs> so you you in there checking everything coming through the door, coming through the door. And so, how long did you say you stay at? And this still on Middleton. On Middleton, I was there probably about four months. Four months because we had that ride what, and they shipped us. What up was your next home. unit? Barry B. Telford. Barry B. Telford. Tell I've unit. never heard Telford that one unit. Before. I done heard of it. I did 10 years on Barry B. Wow. Mm. Yeah. It's the real deal. So you stayed out a majority of your time. I did 10 years over there. That's why I went from a boy to a man. Let's let's talk about it. Yeah, well, what happened that you said that? Well, you know, when I went to Telford unit, I was just still a kid. You know, I'm... Uh, mentally. Mentally, I was a kid. Emotionally, I was a kid. Financially, I was a kid. So I was able to grab my identity and who I am and what I was going to end up becoming, which you see now, all that came from Barry B. Telford Unit. I was blessed to do time around some solid people, guys that got life sentences, 60 years. And, you know, when you a rider and, and you, you know, you, you like that, it's going to be dudes that's going to take a liking into you. But then when I think about, you know, what you said that when you came in to prison, you saw your friends and it was a party and, you know, it's almost like you back out in the world with your friends. But now you graduate into wanting to do better, wanting to be better, want to come out and do something different. How um, how were you able to display that while you were in there and not feel like, you know, peer pressure? Is there peer pressure in there? Oh, of course, it's peer pressure. And. The guy you see sitting here wasn't the same guy that was at the unit. Not at that unit. Not at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that I wanted to do nothing productive with my life. I, I wasn't even aware that I had the skills to be able to do something with myself. I was just simply in there, you know, just trying to survive, keep my head up with my partners. You know, we just passing time. But as you pass the time, you're going to be blessed to meet individuals, you know. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, read this book. You know what I'm saying? You ain't reading that book or... Hey, man, you need to go to Tylene service or, hey, you need to go to GED or, you know, just different things. You know, in a 10-year span, you're going to interact with so many different people, but it's going to be some guys that's going to gravitate towards you where you're going to be able to really get some real good game from them. Tell me a story that you heard while you were in prison because, you know, you, you come across a lot of lifers. You, you come across a lot of people telling you things because they want you to do better. Um, tell me a story that you heard that really impacted your life. Um, so I won't say it was it was a story. Mm -hmm. So one thing I always did when I was in prison, and I would meet a guy who done been to prison two or three times, or I would meet a guy 
who got 50, 60 years, I would always ask them, like, was it worth it? Or? Right. And the number one thing, I never forget that they would always say, like, bro, I tripped out. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't even worth it. Like, damn, I tripped out. And I would be sitting on the wreck yard with them, and I'd be like, damn. You know what I'm saying? Even though I got this time, I'm going to get back out. Mm -hmm. Bro, I ain't never getting out. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that always stuck with me to where I was like, man, you don't want to make a split-second decision that can cost you the rest of your life. Because a lot of these dudes with these life sentences, man, that was a split-second decision. It wasn't something that they like, pondered on for weeks or they plotted and schemed. That was some heat of the moment, a split quick decision, mm -hmm. and that shit cost them a life sentence. So I always told myself, like, man, don't never do nothing um, just in the heat of the moment like that, bro. That's going to cost you. I think the craziest thing I ever heard was God told me that he, he, he I was like, man, how long, how long did you stay out? He say he never made it home. Yeah. Meaning he got out at the Walls unit. That little money they gave him, tried to do a you know, trying to make a move because they used to let him out at the Golden Gates. Right. And right back in. Right back in. Never made it. <laughs> what did he do? Trying to hustle. Trying to and hustle. And they caught him right there. <laughs> he never made it home. And he I got a lot of time for that. Yeah, he came back, but he, 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 he that probably his fourth time. You know oh, what I mean? Man. Like some people just keep this recidivism. Mm -hmm. They just keep going back and keep going back. I got Kim folks like that. 76% of all inmates return back to prison within the first three to five years. And I always wonder, how can we fix it? I always wonder why they keep doing that. You know what I mean? Because, like, you see where it's going to lead you. They always say, either I'm going to be dead or in prison. And you keep going back to prison. I'm like, why? Just like when I asked you earlier, I'm like, you went to um, juvenile and you always get caught. I'm like, it should be like a thing. Like, okay, I don't need to keep doing this. Well, for me, it was a point in time, you know, for a while, I just didn't give a damn. I ain't care about you, none, none of that. Only thing I care about is the hood and my niggas. Mm. That's, That's how I was living for a while, you know what I'm saying? It really took me growing and maturing and developing and going through a lot of heartache and trials and tribulations to be able to transform that mentality. But for a while, it was, hey, man, this what it is. So did you, when you end up getting an extra three years, did you get into a riot, riot or something, something transpired? No, so I got an extra five years. Okay, they just extra. gave me two years back time, and mm -hmm. I got caught, uh, well, I got caught with some weed, but it was probably like two or three ounces. They call it the, uh, introducing contraband into a uh, prison. A facility. It's some a particular. And you got that much time for it? They gave me five years for, or or I could have told on the girl, but to tell, right? That's worse. Yeah, man, I can't never go back to home like that. Yeah, no, and that's and that's crazy, and and that's that's something that's commendable because you got guys that's talking and telling and doing all kind of, you know what I mean, doing all kind of weird stuff. A lot of times in today's society, when you see it, it's it's wild. But for you to say, hey, I ain't, I, I wasn't going out like that, that's just solid. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you don't have a lot of solid people no more. Um, Yeah, it's crazy because I be, <laughs> this is the funny part, the uh, the guards and stuff, when they was trying to get me to tell, they thinking that I'm trying to be a badass. I'm <laughs> telling them this ain't got nothing to do with me being a badass. Mm -hmm. If I tell, if I do this, what y'all want me to do, man, my family going to disown me. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't even go back home. It's bigger than... um. Then what y'all talking about, I can't never go back to Oak Cliff like this. My mama, my brothers, like my family, they'll disown me behind something like that. Mm -hmm. I know it don't mean nothing to y'all, but that shit mean everything where I'm from. And I can't I can't do that. I got to uh, take this little old time and go sit down somewhere. Wow. So it was much bigger than what they was thinking about. They thinking I'm trying to be a, a badass mm -hmm. inside of the prison. I'm like, nah, I'm thinking about... Going home and my family and stuff, I'm like, man, my mama ain't gonna never, she'll never accept that. I know it sounds crazy, but like I say, my mom and my family, they different. They not. Uh -huh. Is that, is that like after ten years of being on tail for unit? Is that when they ship you after you catch that case? So I actually caught the case in '06. They didn't ship me to like ten. Oh, okay. That, that, that's wild because you would have thought they would have shipped you right off the. No, nah, they sent me back there to close custody. I think I did like a year and a half back there in lockup. Okay. Then, you know, you got to go to medium custody, then population. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I I caught the case in 06. They shipped me in like 10 or 11, shipped me to a stale unit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, it's, it's something because when you think about just the whole prison system, do you think that, does, does, is that true 
rehabilitation or reform, or is they doing anything in there to help people? Um, I will say um, TDCJ does provide you with the classes, with the opportunities, but at the end of the day, it don't even matter what the prison system gives you. It's about you and what you're going to do. You know what I'm saying? I know they got GED classes down there. I, I know dudes still won't go get their GED, wow. and it's free. I know dudes who don't do nothing but sit in the day room and play chess and watch the young and the wrestlers all day. Versus yeah. you got other individuals who going to take full advantage of every class, every program. Mm -hmm. So it's really about you. Yeah. You know, now you got individuals that's going to place the blame on the prison system where they ain't got this, they ain't got that. You know, this ain't the Hilton, right? Yeah. Yeah, this the penitentiary. So, you know, I... I I tell people re rehabilitation starts with you. That's real. But then you have those people who come out who do all of the, the right things and then come out and can't find a job, can't... Um, you don't want a job. Say but it that's, again. What, that's what Talk I keep to hearing. Nah, you don't, you don't want a job. go back to their neighborhood and, you know, all their old partners because they expect them, they're going to come back and start doing the same thing. They're handing them everything that they're trying to get rid of because they broke, they ain't got no money right now and they see, you know what I mean? So they nah. jump right back into it. I can't uh, agree with you, Miss Jamaica. I can't. <laughs> no, I'm just, with you. I'm just telling you what I see and what I've heard. So it's a lot of individuals, and I often tell people this. You know what I'm saying? We got to be realistic about this, homie. You've been incarcerated for the last five, ten years. You don't have no job history. You don't have no work skills. Why do you think somebody's going to pay you top dollar to come work at their company? What value do you bring to them? Mm -hmm. Getting out of prison, you got to be realistic. Like, I've been gone 20 years, 10 years, 5 years. I don't got no, nothing, you know what I'm saying, no work history, nothing. I'm going to go to this little warehouse, and I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. That's what I've done. Mm -hmm. And all I warehouses work. hire felons. Man, every warehouse in the city of Dallas will give you a job. Okay, okay. Let, let, let me... um. I want to come out of prison with him because he didn't know nothing about the cell phones and all this stuff. I well, talk I know about, about it. it. You, you know, a little bit. Not, a little not, bit. Not, yeah. Before you come out of prison, I have one question because I know you have, um, I see on your Instagram, you have, um, I don't know if she's your wife or your- the Senorita. Your senorita. And I've seen you mention that she, was, she held you down. Was she with you during prison time? She did 10 years with me. That's hard. That's hard. Yeah, okay. my senorita, she rocked with me for 10 years. Um, I met her while I was incarcerated. How? I mean, you know, I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I was in prison, man, you know, I had it jumping in there. Me and my partners, we some of the guys who ran the prison system. Mm -hmm. So, our contraband that's being introduced into mm -hmm. her, me and my partners going to have something to do with it coming through the door. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, at this time, I'm kind of getting my hate up with my weight. I'm reading books. I'm working out. You know, I'm feeling out. So, uh, my little brother got killed. And when my little brother got killed, this young lady reached out to me just paying her condolences and this, that, and the other. And, man, me being the live guy that I am, you know, one thing <laughs> led to another. Voila, there go the bricks. Man, oh, okay. That's, that's good. I love man. the fact she held you down through <clears throat> the whole thing, too. Yeah, yeah. But, you, you, know, one, one, you know, one thing about it, man, God don't make no mistakes. Right. You know what I mean? And really, he opened a door no man can shut. No I man. I really believe that. So at the end of the day, when I see something like that happen, it doesn't surprise me because I know the power of God. You know what I mean? It's so it, it, for you to come, okay, you get out, you or you about to get out, and when you you because I'm fast forwarding now, you you make parole or, or how does that go? I discharge. You, you discharge day for day, day for day, day for day. So you come home, no no parole, none no of that. No parole, stuff. no probation, Did, none of that. No uh, what they call them for pre release facility, pre none of that. I walk, Save, none of that. I walked straight out of prison and went and got in the car. Man, so you you come home. What's your what's your thoughts when you coming home? That's when the reality of my mother being dead just really hit me. I, I, I wanted to, I, I remember seeing that. So what what year was it when she died before you got out? My mother died in twenty eleven. Okay, and you got out in. And I got out in twenty fourteen. Got it. Got it. So. You know, you know, you when you in prison and they come tell you somebody got killed or somebody died, you hear it and you know it, you feel it, but the reality of it don't really hit you till you walk out. You weren't able to go to her funeral. No. -uh. Okay, cause I know sometimes when you're in prison, they allow you to go. Sometimes I heard that, but the I whole time I never seen that in my never life. Seen that in my life. Mm. I, I'm not saying it don't that happen. That it don't happen. I know it probably do. But it I probably ain't do. But I'm saying in the 13 and a half years that I spent in TDCJ, mm -hmm. I've never seen nobody go to a funeral. To a funeral. Now 
I don't know about other states or whatever. I'm talking about in Texas. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the day I walked out of prison, my girl and uh, my sister knew they was out there waiting on me. And when I went out there, they were hugging me. Hey. And I was just kind of like, damn. Like you you're looking around for her and you. Yeah, I'm like, there. you know, my mama, she did. My mm -hmm. little brother did. You know. Wow. You know, we getting in the car and I'm like, we ain't finna go home. We, I mean, I'm finna go home, but I'm not going home to the home that I, I knew. knew. Yeah, I'm going to where my girl done got us a little apartment and mm -hmm. we finna, you know what I'm saying? And just the reality of all that was kind of hitting me to where I was just like, damn, you know what I'm saying? That shit's serious, like, you know what I'm saying? Did your grandma also pass away while you were in prison too? My grandmother passed away. My mother died. My little brother died. So when I came home, the only people were still here was- Was um, your brother. My my baby brother, he was in prison. Oh, he was in prison. He was okay. in prison when I came home. And um, my sister, which is really my auntie, but we grew up together, so we called each other sister and brother. Her and my grandfather. Hmm. That was it. Wow. That's, and you know, and and because and, Charlotte Lowe Jr. told, you know, he lost Charlotte Lowe, uh, but people don't realize uh, he lost his uh, mother, too. Okay. 11 months apart. Okay. When he, was, he did a four-year stint. And I interviewed him, and he was like, man, they don't, no, people don't talk about that part. But it's tough, because he said the same thing you saying. When he came home, he came home, and he lost his granddaddy, too. Yeah, so the it's reality, like it was different. It was different. You know, when you walk out that prison, you thinking you finna go see the fam. Everybody and, finna kick it. Yeah, and I'm like, you know, when I walked out, the, it was just the reality of everything I had lost. It had really hit me then. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Man. Like, damn, you playing these games, Vicky really did. Wow. Juicy really dead. Carolyn really dead. Like, ain't no going to 756 Deerwood. You finna go to this little old apartment that your girl got for y'all, you know what I'm saying? And you finna start building from right there. Wow. It was just the reality of that. It hit me different. Wow. So when you, okay, you you come home and now you home. Um, what was the biggest difference that you've seen in the world since you had left 13 years earlier? Uh, The internet. The internet. That was the biggest difference for me. You know, I was fascinated with the fact that at the clip, clip, you know, it just that Something click right happen. there. Man, I got access to billions of people. That's when hard. I saw that, I was just like, man, I got to find something to put on the Internet. Man, I got access to millions of people with just the click of a button. Man. I know I can put something together. It got to be something. That I, I can, can do put, something, right? Man, I got access to millions of people from this one button. Oh, it's going down. It's going down. It's going down. So what down. was your first move? Like, what did you do? I immediately went and got me a job. Okay. Uh, when they picked me up, we was riding down the freeway, and the first question I asked them, hey, what's up with that job y'all was telling me about? They were like, damn, boy, slow down. I'm like, nah, I'm trying to go on. chill. They were like, Chill. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to chill. They were like, no, nah, you need to chill. I'm like, man, I've been chilling for almost 14 years. I'm ready to get to it. So my first number one thing I went and did was got a job. And I started out making $9 an hour. That's hard. That's hard. I like it. Yeah, because I know already that's going. And, and and you had patience, right? Like you you had to have patience because man, sometimes I was people chilling. get. Yeah, there you go. So so when you get the job, uh, it was it probably was cool and fun to be because you were around people all the time that, when you locked <laughs> up. Listen, when I got the job, so look, I get the job, right? I started out making nine dollars an hour. Man, within six months to a year, I was a supervisor making almost seventeen, eighteen dollars an hour, that's and I done that on accident. Dang. So, I wasn't even trying to do that. Wow. wow. That's a blessing. So when you, okay, and, and I don't want to move you too fast, but we got to get to these trucks, man, because you, you pulled the move, man. Like, what made you get into 18 wheelers? Because every time I see you, you killing the game, man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I actually got in the trucking because of one of my partners. I see, you know, he rocking the big chains. He looking good. And, man, I was tired of being in that warehouse. I'm really thinking my partner hustling. How long you stay in the money. warehouse? About two years. Two years, okay. Yeah, I, I worked in the warehouse about two years. Uh, yeah, about two years. And so when you when you when you finally get to the, uh, this this vision, that I'm gonna go on and do these trucks. It ain't had nothing to do with the trucks. It had the only reason I went and got in the trucking because I saw how my partner was living. Mm -hmm. All I cared about was the bag. <laughs> I didn't care nothing about actually being a truck driver. I was so fascinated with like 
Bro, you living like that? I'm talking about my, my partner look like one of the biggest dope boys around. He was kicking it. Man, this man don't sell not a piece of dope. If he see you committing a crime, he going to call the law. Wow. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I was just so like, damn, bro, you living like this and you don't do nothing but drive trucks? He was like, yeah, that's all I do. I was like, hell nah. It got to be something. I'm like, bro, you know I ain't the law. You ain't got to shake me, bro. <laughs> he like, man, go on, man. I'm telling you what I do. I drive trucks. I was like, shit, if driving trucks got you living like that, man, I'm finna go see what's up. I went and got my CDL license. That, that was the only reason that I got into trucking. It had nothing to do with me wanting to be a truck driver. or None any, of that. No, it had. The, the lifestyle. It, it was simply the lifestyle. I saw how my partner was living. I was like, yeah, I'm finna go check this out. When did, okay, and then, because cause, cause being the Brewster you are today, when did it hit you that you wanted to help other people that were coming out of prison to be truck drivers? So I saw that that was the way for us to get home. So in the trucking industry, they don't give a damn about our background. They don't give a damn that we black. They don't give a damn that we got tattoos. All these people care about is can you get this load from point A to point B? Boy, if you can do that, they're going to give you a bag of money. Once I saw that, I was like, oh, this is the way, bro. I'm not saying this is the way forever. I'm saying this is the way to get on your feet. Yeah. Once you get on your feet, you can uh, venture off into this or venture off. You know, you can spread your money how you want to. But for anybody coming fresh out the penitentiary, anybody that's in the streets looking to change their life, boy, the quickest way to do this and get you a bag of money is go get the CDL license and go drive a truck. Wow. How hard is it to drive a truck? Man, it's one of the easiest things in the world. I know people who started and because especially when you drive outside of Texas, you uh -huh. know, you have different weather and that snow and stuff. I know a lot of people who jackknife. Right. And stop. Like, no, this is not for me. Well, I mean, I won't say it's for everybody, but I will say, man, we tipping, we tipping slow. So I'm not into being a super trucker. I'm not a super trucker. I'm a safe, responsible trucker. So the speed limit 70, I might not be going number 65. Man, I'm just trying to get here safely. It's the guys that's the super truckers that's normally having them type of issues. Mm -hmm. Wow. And um, about this trucking thing, because I, I hate trucks. Okay. I hate when I'm driving down the street, especially late night, whatever. Do y'all really do this? It does feel like y'all be blocking the road. I promise you, it feel like y'all be blocking the road purposely. <laughs> we always feel like y'all be on y'all see Be like, yeah, we're going to block this road. We're going to this. <laughs> Is that true? No, it's not. They don't intend. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Because y'all be going slow. And I'm like, they right back. I'm like, are y'all talking to each other? Nah. So I often tell my wife this. And I'm telling you this now. <laughs> when you on the freeway or you on the road and you see an 18 wheel, get away from him. That's right. Immediately. tell me that. Man, get I'm away from him. That. Either go on, get past him or go on, oh, let him let go. Because you are in a car like this. Man, this man is in a whole goddamn machine, and he's suddenly have fifty thousand pounds behind him. So he can't just stop. How you can just stop this car on a dime? Mm -hmm. He can't stop that truck on a dime like that. Get away from him. But if he can't stop on a dime, why some of these trucks be going like right on somebody back like that? Sometimes to try intimidating people. They want you to get out their way. But if they know they can't stop it like that, why they be doing that? Cause they got issues mentally. <laughs> <laughs> they got issues. That's why. I, listen, I drive trucks. I own a trucking company. I tell people all the time when you when you see an eighteen wheeler, you buy eighteen. Get away from home. Go on, let that truck go, or you slow down, or go. But get away from that truck. Let me tell you something, my homeboy. I was just day, thinking about old that. boy Prince. A brake kicked off. Break a brake shoe off of a truck kicked out. Went through his window and hit him right here. Crushed everything. He done had four. The old boy, do the stinking leg. That dude. Oh, one no. Do the. You was locked He's up. He's a rapper. You. I forgot. You were locked up. You. It, that was that stinking leg came out. You was gone. Yeah. But it, it, anyway, uh, he got a new group called C4S. But he got hit right here. It went through his window. And I'm gonna show it to you. The piece when when we get through with this. But and the truck driver didn't even know because he kept he driving. Kept going. Yeah. He didn't know. He didn't know. Man, How that, easy that, is that, that, that to jump that, off of a truck? How easy is that? It's very easy. So really? you got to keep in mind, them, them semi-trucks, you got 50, 60, 70,000 pounds back there. A lot of them don't do their pre-trips. They ain't even checking the truck and trailer. They just jumping in and going. They don't give a damn about this truck. They, it ain't theirs. So they just jumping in and they going. So breaks you can just wow. fly off easy. 
if you ain't did a pre trip on that truck the way you supposed to, to where you can identify, yeah, it can happen. How? Mm. How? Okay, I want to get back to you <clears throat> and just the reform and everything that you've been doing because it's great what you're doing, man. I, God bless you, man. Appreciate it. helping these guys, helping going back into the prison like we spoke the other night and helping people, man. That's that's the way. Now, but what what I want to ask you is like when you basically got into it and you st and you start to help these brothers. How did you start that? How did you even get, how did you figure out how to even embrace the whole situation? Step by step. Yeah. As far as, as far as the reform Bringing movement? People, yeah, the reform. Like, I'm going to help this guy to help this guy, and this is how I'm going to do it. How did you get the education to do that? So, really, um, it was just about, you know, I did almost 14 years down there. I know so many thousands of inmates. So, when they get out of prison, they hitting me like, look out, bro. Man, you driving them trucks, come on out. So I'd be like, man, just come to the yard, man. I'm going to show you how to do this. So in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, hey, come out here. I'll train you, show you. I'm not knowing that it's people out here. They not going to teach you about the trucking game. Yeah. They hiding the game from you. They don't want to expose this to you. So I'm like, man, I don't give a damn about telling you what to do. Yeah, go over here, do this. This how you do that. This how you do that. And people were so in love with it to where the platform just grew on its own. It grew for me giving out free information. Mm. Wow. The information that people be hiding and the information people trying to charge you a million dollars for, Brewster going to give it to you for free. I don't mind giving you the game for free because at the end of the day, you still got to be the one that get up and go put the work in. That's right. Tell me about the first time um, you helped somebody and um, what was it that you did and... Did they come back to you and the gratitude? How did that make you feel? Um, I've actually helped numerous of people. And the gratitude, um, it don't always go like that. Um, I can't tell you the amount of people who I've exposed trucking to. I've helped them get their CDL, yet they don't appreciate it. They mm. feel like I owe them something or I wow. ain't do enough for them. Mm. Yeah. That's crazy. Versus it's been people who, you know, But you show you had some people who Oh come. yeah, nah, it's some people, man. They love me to death for exposing trucking mm -hmm. to them. And I'm always happy, you know, about knowing that I was able to give you a skill set, you know what I'm saying, something that can help you and your family. You yeah. know, keep keep it going. But you're not really doing it for the gratitude. You're doing it because you know the right thing to do. Well, I do it because um man, I wanna help you. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I often tell people for me to have gotten where I'm at right now, so many people done helped me. Right. I done got so many blessings and lucky breaks, and I got a support system out this world. Like, in order to uh, pull off greatness, you're going to need a team to do it. Mm -hmm. You know how the uh, the Olympic team, the dream team, they was able to win all that. They had a powerful team, you know what I'm saying? Right. So to pull off anything great, you're going to need a team. Yeah. So when it comes to me, I, I love to help them. Because I'm like, bro, this is something that can really change your life if you get for real about it. Mm -hmm. But I often tell people it don't go like how we think it should go. The people that you're trying to help, them will be the very people that'll be mad and talking down on you. That's them will true. be the very people who feel like you ain't did enough. I gave you a sandwich, but that was you going to say that that wasn't enough because I didn't give you no cheese or I didn't give you no mustard on it. Mm -hmm. But I gave you a turkey sandwich. Yeah, but you ain't put no cheese on it, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, damn, okay, or... Man, you gave me a sandwich with cheese, mustard, all that, but you didn't give me a bag of chips, though. Yeah. So, you know, it has its pros and its cons. That reminds me about, like, the Bible and Jesus would always do talking parables. But a lot of people didn't understand what he was saying. They wanted him to cut it straight and just tell him, you know, what it is, but he wouldn't. Right. He's like, who have ears to hear, let him hear. Not everybody will, you know, accept your advice and just take it and run with it and build onto it. Some people like it like that. They want to be like, oh, well, add this, add that. They want they want everything given to them. Oh, you know? yeah. It's unfortunate. You know, it's something that I done dealt with because, you know, I, I done helped so, so many people. But in the process of helping them, you know, they feel like that wasn't enough. You didn't do enough to help me. Yeah, you helped me, but that wasn't enough. But it's like if I didn't do nothing, then what? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you always got to consider those things. Mm-hmm. So when you um here, here's why here's here it when you help these guys have any of them took off like you and start helping other people have you do you have that story or so I actually got a few guys who um who started their own trucking companies and they doing their own thing now I won't necessarily say they doing 
what, what I'm doing? doing as far as with the reform movement, but they have started their own trucking company and they able to provide for their family. Man. What I'm doing, it's not for everybody. everybody. You know what I'm saying? Everybody can't handle the responsibilities and the pressure that come with that type of position. But yeah. it's a lot of guys that I mentor who's came in, they done learned the trucking business, they done went and got their own trucking trailer, they balling in the mix, so I hardly hear from them now. You you, you come home and you, you get this, you jump on this internet, people loving you, you growing, your followers growing, everybody watching for you. Um, People, you see me and Jim Jones over there. I hear you got a relationship with Jim. That's my uh, boy. Like, 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 how did you even link with Jim Jones? Um, Jim, um, he probably one of the first artists who ever just really reached out to me. Like, man, I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. Let me know what I can do to help you. Wow. You know what I'm saying? I met him at uh at the Turkey Leg Hut. Oh, okay. With my boy ETCO. Everything check out down okay. there. Chris Bacon. We was down there, and um, he was like, man, I'm a let you meet Jim, and he introduced us, and about two, three days later, Jim hit my DM and was like, hey, man, I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. Anything I can do to assist you, it's a go. And um, I can actually say bro done stood on that anytime. So, you know, I got guys that come on from prison who has never left the city before. So um, I be like, man, you ain't never left Dallas? Nah. Man, I'm going to take you to New York. What? I'm going to take you to New York, man. I'll take them up there to New York. I hit Jim. Hey, bro, I got some people that's coming up, man. I want to turn them out. Jim, pull up. You going to pull up? <clears throat> Jim going to pull up, man. Hey, come meet us over here. Show you a grand good time, man. So, yeah, Jim about the business. So, yeah, that's uh, yeah. every time I've met him or uh, we've talked with him, it's always been solid. It was more on the clothes vamp life for us being in the store. Uh -huh. He had a clothing line called Vamp Life. And, uh, yeah, I would always see him at the conventions, man. Yeah. We yeah. always go. And we going in, a, in about three weeks. We yeah. always been going. Jim, one of the few. Um, Real one. He, he a solid one. He reached. He was one of the first ones to ever reach out to me and be like, hey, man, I see what you're doing. I like what you're doing. Let me know what I can do to get behind the move. Yeah, yeah. I, mine, Junebug is the nigga that I actually link with him through. Me and Junebug, real cool. He out of New York. Got a store called Clout Like Mine. So, basically, me and Junebug, I think it was Lionel. Them boys, was, them slow buck guys. It's some guys that was doing. What you know about slow bucks? That's my partner. Oh man. <laughs> you know I know about them because I was selling. I sell clothes. Them boys sell clothes, man. He talking about my boy slow buck. Yeah. One like, time for that boy buck, that's man. That's hard. <laughs> Shout out, man. Like, like it's 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 my boy June Bug, the one that owned clout clothing. He linked me with all those guys. He called me his OG. So at the end of the day, I just deal with these clothes a lot. You know what I'm saying? Um, Jim, that's how I met Slow Bucks through Jim. That's hard. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm telling you. It's a yeah. whole circle. It, yeah. It's a whole circle of them, man. So, matter of fact, if you, I think me and uh, Joel Santana on the picture, Slow standing behind us. Slow we, Buck. Yeah, yeah. I'm finna show you a picture of him. Uh, I did an interview with him. That's hard. Up there in New York. Well, I interviewed him for my uh, real reform, what I had going on. Let me see if yeah, I can. Yeah, I thought I seen you interviewing. You interviewed Lil Kiki, too. Yeah. That's why I'm going to ask you about that in a second once you find that that's picture. That's the Don. Yeah, that's that boy Buck. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. You kicking it, ain't you? Yeah. So you, you and you got that reform hidden, too, on it, man. Yeah. You ain't playing with it, is you, man? Nah, we pushing reform. You know, Buck, he, he got his thing going on up there in New York, man. He trying to get some things. He trying to bring financial literacy to the hood up there. Okay. So, uh, you know, we done chopped game on several occasions about what they got going on and just how we can connect and really, you know, make a real impact across the country. That's hard, man. So when you, I see you go, like, <laughs> like when I was interviewing Lil Kiki, I, I, some kind of way we brought you up. He had to, I asked him, I said, man, where you hang with all these penitentiary niggas, man? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He said, man, I just, didn't he tell me, I just love these penitentiary niggas, man. These stories, man. They got these stories, man. So he just, you know, we were riding with that and you came up, man. It's just like, he was like, yeah, yeah, I got to link y'all together, man. That's the so, dumb. you know, just how did you and him build such a relationship and a bond? So, uh, look, Kiki, that's my favorite rapper of all time. Like that's I'm not saying that just because you know we so close now. I'm saying before I ever met him, that's all we listen to. I think my partner, he'll vouch for me on that. We listen to Lil Kiki from sun up to sundown. But uh, my partner ETCO, he got a promotion game he putting down out there in um in Houston. So what he do is local artists, or well not even local artists, artists from all over the world. You trying to get your music heard, or you trying to do something exotic? He the one to do it. So I'm telling him about Lil Kiki. He laughing. He like, 
Boy, you for real about Kiki, huh? I'm just like, man, ain't I no love that look Kiki, same. man, ain't nobody messing with the dumb, man. Go listen to my boy music. That's the Jay Z or the side down That's here, hard. you know what I'm yes, saying? Sir. Straight up. So he like, man, I'm a, I'm a plug in with him. I say, what? <laughs> <laughs> He said that. I said, what? He said, yeah, I'm a call key. Let, yeah, I, I sat right there all day <laughs> at the turkey leg hood. He like, bro, chill. I'm like, man, where key at? Straight up. Where, where the key, key at? Man, today. where key at, man? Man, key pulled up. He pulled up. Man, key pulled up. What's up, baby? I said, ooh. <laughs> that boy done pulled up and... <laughs> Man, it was all love, man. We ate big in there. I told him about the reform movement, what we trying to put down. Key was like, shit, I'm with this right here. He was like, man, I'm feeling this right here, man. What, what, what you need me to do? How can I get behind the movement? How can I support you? It wasn't no no cap, no stunting. He wasn't on no goofish, none of that. He was like, hey, man, I, I'm with this right here. I see you helping the homeless in the hood, the homeless that's coming home. I got a million partners coming home from prison. They need this right here. That's hard, man. I was like, shit, all right. And I thought he was just talking, man. Uh, but, bro, he bought that. Wow, and promotion and just just linking together just whatever you need. If man, you need my voice did. on something, man, that's whatever who did you need. need. Whatever I need, whatever I have needed from the words say go, key done been there. That's, that's who hard, done the soundtrack. Man. The soundtrack to my book. That's hard, man. Yeah, and and I, like I said, when you think about okay, just look at it. You you went down there. That's favor, man. That's God, man. Cause every door is opening up, man. Everything you doing is working. Oh, it's man. That's why I tell people, you gotta be a good dude in the game. You gonna need blessings. You gonna need favor, and you're not gonna get that if you on some uh, fuck boy shit. Yeah. So you got to be a good dude, good person. And, and then I tell people, you know, the relationships I done build, I keep it solid with them. That's hard. You man. know what I'm saying? I don't try to use them or call them for no BS or nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a genuine relationship. I can honestly say out of all the artists in the industry, Key is the one that I got the most closest, genuinest, relationship. you know, relationship with. Yeah. And, and he definitely one of those guys, man. I picked the phone up, he answered. It's been like that with me too, so I know what you're talking about, man. Just so God opened the door for certain people to be in your life, man. And he one of those dudes, man. From Mr. Lee, him, the people that I done seen sit in this room, man. I know it was ordained by God. Yeah. I know without a shadow of a doubt. Bro, good people. And he love to eat. He love gonna to eat. <laughs> he gonna show you where all the good food is. <laughs> that's, that's another reason I ain't tight. I look every time I'm with him, he know where the good spots to eat. He know that he know where they at. What he know where that food at. Man. He know where that food at. Hey, Bruce, to meet me over here. They, they got some for us. Yeah. <laughs> Man, so what what's the best, what's your best Kiki? What's the best track for Lil Kiki that you love? The best, the best. Oh, nah. We number been, one. Nah, he got a few number <laughs> ones. Ain't no. T uh. Number one. Oh. Legend Talk is. is uh, I know I heard him. I yeah, know he, yeah, he so said Legend Talk. The reason I like Legend Talk so much is because he dropped it on my birthday. That's hard, man. So I, I kind of feel like the whole album's in dedication to the Dude. boss man. Man. To the boss man, Brewster, the whole goddamn boss album. Boss man, Brewster. He dropped it on my birthday. That's but hard. if I had to just pick one song, man, ain't no one song, man. Boy, he the whole sound of Houston, man. Like, when you think of Houston, you think of the Dunn, man. Yeah, you saying Houston, I'm saying the, the South, South, man. You speaking about the South, man, you going to show love to the Dunn, man, no, straight no, up. I get it, I get it. I feel the same way, but yeah, I, I'm man. a Pimp C fan from Hawk. I'm a little older, but the, the Dunn, is, he right there, man. Yeah, man, I'm rocking lie. with Dunn Key, man. That's the Jay-Z of the South, man. Man, that's hard, man. So, okay, I see you the other day, and I see you with uh with uh with Wallow and Gilly. You, you and Wallow got a... <laughs> Do y'all got a relationship? Because he was locked up for a time. Right. Yeah, nah, me and Wallow, that's my boy. We rock. Um, Wallow, another one, man. You know what I'm saying? Um, Wallow done gave me that access. We got a relationship, so it's always been love. He done been there to support me. Gilly old crazy ass. Gilly crazy in real life. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I'm talking I, about Wallow because cause <laughs> I know he done been through. He got a background. Wallow did was, 20 years. He did 20 years. Right. So that... 
for him to see a movement like you got going on, uh -huh. it got because it wake me up. You know, certain people gonna get like, dang, this dude, you know, making waves and really making a difference. Cause really, when a person come from these situations, they want to make a difference, bro. Right. They want to reach back and grab somebody and help them. So to see you doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it, it's just it's hard, man. Yeah. I love it, bro. I'm oh, being man, I, I, I love it, you, man. man. Oh. Nah, Wallow solid, man. You know what I'm saying? I can call Wallow right now. He down. So, you know, any, he always rock with you. Yeah, he always rock with me the whole little old process. You know what I'm saying? Um, he been out of, you know. So I tell people, you know, what they think is support. Support don't mean me giving you a million dollars or me introducing you to Meek Mills and Jay-Z. You know, support can be something as simple as just picking up the phone and helping you walk through you know what I'm saying? A situation that you having or a deal that you having or, hey, Bruce, you need to do it like this versus doing it like that. So, you know, I just be grateful for the relationship and I like to be able to bring value to him as well. So when I'm dealing with Jim Jones, Kiki, Wallow, whoever it may be, I like to make sure that the relationship is reciprocated. It ain't just no one sided what you can do for me. It's a lot that I can do for you as well. I like that, man. You know, a lot of people just, some people don't get it. You get it, Bruce. man, like I said, man, Boss man, you you really really like like you you've done something that I, I I never seen it done like the way you're doing it before. I'm glad to hear. It. I'm being real. We I ain't watch, done. Man. No, but I just like the way that you're making a difference, man. You know, like I said, going back in, like to see for some of those guys to see you when you go back into the prison system, uh, and and you were locked up with some of them because some of them ain't never getting out. Right. I just how, seen one the other day. How was that? I, I like to I like to hear those stories. Um, so it's always crazy when I go back into prison. So when they see me, they be like, "Hey, what's up, bro?" Woo -woo -woo. But I had the directors or the wardens and the captains with me, so they be playing it cool. So soon as they move around and get out the room, they pull up on the side of me like, "Bitch, what you got going on?" <laughs> <laughs> I be like, "Chill out, bro." They be like. Mom, for real, what, what you doing with them? I be like, you know, I done changed my life around and, you know, I'm That's trying to do one. this. And they be like, the I was paying you, ain't that? <laughs> <laughs> I be like, nah, bro, this what's going on. I know a way for us to get paid. We ain't got to do nothing crazy. The game that we got, what we been doing, we can apply them, so, them same skills, but we can do it on this side of the game. Wow. We ain't got to do nothing crazy. And they be like, damn. You don't wrote a book too? Yeah, that's hard. Well, when you had time to do all this, they be so mind blown because you know when I was in prison, man, I was head first. I'm riding, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. But I tell people that's why the magnitude of what I'm doing is so powerful because nobody, not even myself, ever could have projected that I would turn out to be who I am. Wow, that's hard, man. Um, I think about even Ald to come home and to be to work like he has worked in the time that he has done that. The music that he's been able to produce and put out, you know, for us, you know, what, what he doing, what he doing. And it's crazy you say that because I tell people, um, man, I know guys who done sit in the day room. They do it. They do it. And come right out here and don't do nothing, nothing with it. So the fact to even see Ald be able to transform from going from doing this to actually sitting in the booth, he making songs, he putting videos together, he putting this and that. I'm like, man, you done already won. Man, I, I, I'm amazed at what God can do when you look at uh, film by Miyake, him being locked up with him. Then you see them out. Then they all working together with Lil Kiki at times. Then you there. Bro, I know God is real. I oh, ain't playing real. no games. He set the captives free for real. Because I asked him about that. I always ask God about, man, you know, I got to set the captives free. And when I look at y'all and I look at the movement of what he's done with y'all, it's extraordinary. You can't put nothing. Words can't explain, bro. Um, so I always tell people I contribute. God, without God, without Allah, at the top of the chain, man, would none of this be possible because nobody could have predicted it. We couldn't have seen it. We couldn't have forecast it, called it. Like, this ain't no movie script. This ain't something we sat down no. and put together. Like, according to the statistics and according to the way I was living, I was supposed to come home and either get killed or get sent back to prison. That's correct. But when God intervened, this is what you get. So, you know, I always tell people, man, don't give up on you, man. It's stay believing, stay praying. Wow. So with your trucking business, how many <clears throat> trucks do you have? So I was running up to like 15 trucks at one time. Okay. I've downsized all the way to like four or five. I'm Why? Running. Well, with the way the, uh, the industry is moving right now, the rates ain't what it used to be, overhead. It's just a lot going into it. And not to mention, 
So in order for me to, to be able to run the reform movement like I want to, I can't do that too. Okay, because I would think that with a reform movement and people coming out and you're putting them in the trucks, why not put them in your trucks and have them... So um, it's interesting that you say that. So this is what we're doing. So I can only hire so many people at Brewster Logistics. Really? I can only hire so many people. But if you have a lot of trucks, that you need people hired to... Right, but I only got so many trucks. Well, I'm right. gonna have to get hundreds and hundreds of trucks. Okay, go ahead. Oh no, nah, I don't even need that headache. <laughs> but what I will say is that I can't hire everybody. But we in the process of opening up the big reform CDL school. Okay. So if I can't hire you, I can get I you. Can your, train you. I can train you and get your CDL license. Me being able to train you and get you your CDL license is more important and more valuable than you working at my company. Because I am I can go get drivers from anywhere. Mm -hmm. My trucks are going to move no matter what. Right. But my trucks moving no matter what, how does that benefit you? Mm -hmm. So me allowing you, hey, let's take him over here. Let's get him trained up. Let's show him how to rock these trucks. Let's show him how to move when he out there in traffic. Then we're going to cut him loose from there. I know once you lead a big reform CDL school, you should be able to go and do amazing things out there in the world. Is there, when you went to CDL school and the things you learned, is there anything you learned on the road doing your own thing that you did not learn in CDL school that you wish that they had taught you? So I didn't even go to CDL school. That's not how I got my license. So uh, the only thing that I would say that we're going to teach at Big Reform CDL school that I didn't learn in the process of getting my CDL mm -hmm. is the professionalism. Is mm -hmm. you being able to handle um, conflict resolution because when you out there on the road you're going to come up against a lot of different situations a lot of different issues you can't handle that the way you would if you was in the streets or if you was in prison mm -hmm. so my thing in the process of training you i make sure you understand how to deal with your dispatcher how to deal with dot all that fuck the police you can't have that type of attitude right. because you're going to have to deal with the police mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, that's a part of it. So I make sure that in that training process, you understand the importance of having all your paperwork together. Yes, sir. No, sir. How to do this? How to do that? It's a Jeff game. So I make sure that we train you to know how to move when you out there in traffic. Versus in CDL school, only thing they finna teach you is how to uh, make this left, this right, how to bag up and get on. I'm teaching you more than just how to drive the truck. Right. I'm teaching you how to not only drive the truck, but how to maintain your career, how to further your career. Being a truck driver, I know that you said once you got into business, they didn't judge you. Being a felon, they didn't judge you by tattoos or anything like that. But now that you mentioned the police, when... I don't know if you've ever gotten pulled over or anything like that. And I have know, several times. And they run all of that. Being you are a convicted felon, do they treat you any differently driving a truck than if you were driving a car yes they do so if you have a cdl license you are held to a higher standard than a person who has a regular driver license mm -hmm. so they're going to deal with you completely different because in their mind you know the rules and regulations in depth even though you're a felon you being a felon doesn't matter because the they CDL. look that up though. well they're going to be able to see it but that's irrelevant okay as long as you have the paper the correct paperwork the cr correct credentials Man, you good to go. Okay. The problem a lot of times be that, you know, you think you know the rules and regulations better than the law, man. You mm -hmm. want some fuck the police and you can't have that type of mentality and that attitude, not only in trucking, but in just doing business. Mm -hmm. Yes. You have to know how to take care of the business. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that um, it's not racism going on. That's not to say that the officer not in the wrong. This is not about right or wrong. This is about what's needed to be done in order for us to get to the next to the next, you know, right, level. stage, next level, whatever need. We we trying to progress. Mm -hmm. We not trying to sit here. I often tell people this here. Brewster, I'm not going to die on the side of the highway. Right. Nah. If I got a problem to that extent, I know how to just get your, your badge number or whatever and go make a report. But me arguing with you on the side of the freeway, I mean, I ain't got no win like that. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that the officer is right, wrong. None of that. It's to say that, hey, Brewster got enough sense to know how to talk his way out of dying right here on the side of the highway. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Where do you <clears throat> you see this um, <clears throat> the reform and your business taking you? Um, Man, I see it taking us all across the world, what it's been doing. I see it growing. I see it continuing to impact lives. I see it continuing to help individuals. That's what I see it doing. And we're going to make millions of dollars while doing it. And we're going to look good while doing it. Do you have a timeline? 
<sighs> nah, we done already beat the timeline. Okay. Yeah, we beat the timeline. Seventy six percent of all inmates return back to prison within the first three to five years. I've been home nine years. How many people have you helped that actually went back to prison? Um, I've helped several people that's went back to prison. Okay. And the number one reason is felony in possession of a firearm. Uh, come out and feel like I need this. I mean, you know, that's their attitude. That's their mentality. I ain't living like that. How you do 20 years in prison and you come out and you need nuclear weapons? Who you into it with? Nobody. You just did 20 years. Do you think pres um, felons need, um, like, counselors? Like, when they come out, somebody to, like, mentally? Yes. The trauma of prison trauma. is real. Yeah. Right. Me mental illness is real the trauma and the things you experience while you incarcerated is real because you might really see somebody getting beat the shit out of them or you know you might really see a guy get broke or he may get raped or he may you know it's several things that take place inside of those institutions and they not ain't nobody gonna come out and tell you like damn that hurt me mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying they gonna go in their cell and that's gonna be something they gonna deal with that they gonna internalize and process. So you up against that when you come out here in society, yeah, you need some type of counseling. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was reading an article and I, um, I mentioned it to you the other day. And it was so crazy. It was a man who um, raped a um, couple ladies, right? And during his time of trial, he decided that I'm going to have a sex change. I'm going to become a woman. Now, convicted, they're going to send him to a male prison. But everything has changed. What do you think about that situation? Are they going to just be fucking him to death or not? <laughs> do you think that they should send him to a male prison or should they send him to a female prison? I don't know. He need to go to the male prison. Yeah, now nah, he need to go in there because he sure got his hands full. When he get there, he going to get all the ham he looking for. <laughs> Because the first thing we thought I about, said the same thing. The first yeah. thing we thought about, or I thought about when he did that, especially because he did that change during his sentencing or during trial, I'm like, he's trying to get out of going there. Oh, no, you going. <laughs> <laughs> and they going to be that way now <laughs> when you get there. <laughs> man, I hope we did you justice, man. So how can people get a hold of you if they trying to learn how to get in the truck and then they trying to link with you to try to get themselves, you know? Boss Man Brewster on all social media platforms. We have a non-profit organization from the rec yard to the streets. And at our non-profit, that's an organization that's going to be helping individuals coming home from prison or individuals that's in the streets looking to transform their life. We're in the process of opening up the big reform CDL school. But all proceeds that are donated to the non-profit from the rec yard to the streets that money will be going towards helping individuals get their CDL, helping individuals who need that counseling and things along those lines. So if anybody want to support me or do anything to help me, I need them to donate to the from the rec yard to the streets, nonprofit. It doesn't necessarily even have to be money. I need 15, 20 laptops right now for my school. I got a guy in, in Atlanta, my boy Trailer Strong. This man donated a whole 53-foot trailer to the big reform CDL wow. school. Wow. Wow. That's so when is this when is the CDL school starting? Are you sorry it started? So um we in the process of getting it going online. You'll be able to take your classes online. Once you complete your classes, I'll bring you out there to my yard. We got like three or four trucks and we'll be training them on you. Then you got some people who already got their permits and they just need training. So okay. we'll charge you three, four hundred dollars, let you come out Saturday and Sunday and get that training in. How long does it take? To do what? To get your CDL. <laughs> how long how fast can you learn for a person who who learned quickly how quickly can you get it I'll say about two three weeks okay man <clears throat> did you ever go back in and one of them guards see you and they couldn't believe it what I get that I, say I get that <laughs> all believe the time it. like what this but, is but I love it cause I be, and I always tell them see you never know how somebody gonna turn out that's you right. know how you in here being a dick how that's you right. be in here being an asshole you never know how life can turn out and when they see, that's why I love going back in there. And I make sure I'm looking good when they right. see me because I want you to understand every inmate you see in here, they humans. These are people with families. They got things going on. And I want I want to neutralize and make it normal that when you come in here, you ain't treating them like animals and you just treating them any kind of way because they locked up. They still got action, man. People change every day. People change. When you were heading, when you were coming out, 
Were you one of those that the the guards would say, "Oh, I'm gonna see you back here again"? Listen, this this one of my partners right here, back here. Say, if they would have told you that I'd be boss man Brewster right now when we was in prison, would you believe that? Hell no. Flipped it out, then. Nah, they said he'll be dead or back. In yeah, or back. I feel that like they tell everybody that coming out. No, no it, it, not, it, everybody. Uh, not everybody, but you know the ones. I was just happened to be one of them ones. They really felt like, man, he going to go get killed or he'll be back because that's how I was living in there. But when I came home and saw how good it was, I ain't even got to do none of that. Man, that's so <laughs> true, man. I ain't got to well, do man, none hey, of that. Hey, Brewster, man, we love you, brother. Boss, man, man, thank Great. you, man. I love it, bro. Like I said, it's one of my favorite ones because it's a success story. Mm -hmm. And you and I know, you know, everybody don't have that story. Everybody don't do that work. You know what I'm saying? Right. So to see that, I just know that it's big. It's God, man. Say, man, listen, man. Top three artists of all time before we get off here. Because you say Kiki is number one. Dead or alive, any genre. Top three artists of all time. I got to get that. Your top three. Number one. You know Don Key, number one. <laughs> number two. Yo, got it. All right, number three. <laughs> That three get them every Always. <laughs> you gotta cut some people off of that list. Yeah. I know what it is. I already know. Come on, so, number three. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on before we leave. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on before we leave. Every time, boy. Let, let, let me see right, something here. Oh Don't God. shout nobody else out. I ain't gonna shout <laughs> nobody out. I'm saying, my boy Donkey, my boy got it. Ooh, that third artist. <laughs> I'm saying because you know. Come on. We don't know. Who is, some, is, nah, who uh, is it? No, number three. And then remember, it's any genre that are alive. So it don't only have to be rap. It can be anything. Because I love R&B. Okay, so well, you is? can throw somebody in there. Man, you know what, man? I'm going to go with my boy, um. Freddie Jackson, man. Hey, that's all. Okay. You are my lady, man. Yeah, I'm going to roll with my boy Freddie, Freddie man. Jackson, but man. But I want to know why you have Yo Gotti in as a number two. Well, first Yo of all. Yo Gotti can rap. I'm oh, just no, asking. No, Gotti the real deal, but he ain't done key. <laughs> but the reason I got Gotti for number two, because he's another um, guy who um, I follow the movement. Everything he's been able to do with the CMG brand, everything he's done with his music, it's, uh, it's prolific. If you listen to him, he's going to give you the blueprint of what you need to do mm -hmm. to get to where you need to go. His have, music. Have you met him yet? I have not met Gotti yet. I'm waiting on somebody to make the connection. That's real. Mm -hmm. That's real. Hey, man, thank you for coming on the show. For sure. We done done it. Done done it. Listen, it's been another great segment. A In boss the talk, books. A Boss Talk 101. What a boss is talk. And we out.